Psalm 107, Psalm 107, verse number 1, simply says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Today I want to talk to you about what I believe is a transformational, transcendent truth. A truth that I believe colors every aspect of our relationship with God. It colors how we pray, what we expect from God, how we read and understand the Bible. It colors our trust during trials when we can't trace the hand of God, our faithfulness to God when life seems unfair. It colors everything about our relationship with God. It is so, so important that I believe that if you don't have this spiritual truth in your heart, it will trip you up in your relationship with the Lord. What spiritual truth am I talking about? Well, we just sang about it. The truth that God is good. Our grasp of the goodness of God colors everything in our relationship with God and how we relate to Him. And so today we launch in a new series called exactly what we just sang, Good, Good Father. And my prayer is that by the end of the series, each of you will have such an understanding of how good God is that you'll be able to do what Psalm 107 verse number 1 says, and that's give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you speak to our hearts? Would you make this message relevant and real, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may be seated. Ever since the beginning of time, the enemy of our soul has tried to do two things. The first thing is to convince mankind that there is no God. And he's lost that argument for the most part. There are some that obviously have bought into that delusion. But the next illusion for those that believe that there is a God is to try to convince us that even though he may exist, he's not very good. And if he can get us to believe any one of those two things, he can trip us up in our relationship with the Lord. You might recall the story of the Garden of Eden. God created this fantastic, amazing place called Eden, which, by the way, means delight. And he created this place for his Creation to live in, not for God to live in. God already had a real nice place to live in. You could read about it. It's called heaven. And it's absolutely beautiful in every single way. But God put a little heaven on earth when he created Edom. And it was a paradise in every single way. It was beautiful. The weather was perfect. It was San Diego-like weather, right? The leather, weather was so great. No, no, no rain for like 20 days in a row like we've had over here. And spoil anything to where you get 77 degrees one day and you feel like, wow. Oh, this is great. It was beautiful every single day. There was no labor. They didn't have to work the land. They didn't have to cook their dinner. Food grew on trees. You didn't have to come home from work and slave over a hot stove. You didn't have to water your grass or your gardens. There was a mist that came up from underneath the ground and just gave the, the flowers just the right amount of water that they needed. It was beautiful. Gold abounded and precious stones abounded. It was everything that mankind could hope for and simply because God wanted us to live in such a delight. There was one restriction. You know the story. The restriction was, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you do, you will surely die. You will die. And it says in the original language, you'll die twice. You'll die physically, experience physical death, but then you'll die spiritually, separation from me. And so that was the only thing. So along comes the enemy of our soul with what I call a demonic delusion. And he says, well, as God told you that you should eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and by the way, the fact that God said don't eat of that tree tells us that God never intended for us to know evil. Evil was the byproduct of, of Adam and Eve eating of that tree. And he says, if God told you don't eat of that tree, and they said, well, God not only said don't eat it, he said don't touch it either, which God really never said. It was a fence law that they put around that command to make sure they didn't get close to it. So the enemy says, well, the reason why God told you that is because God knows that in the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to be like God and knowing good and evil. You're going to be just like God. And God doesn't want you to be like him. Interesting thing about it was they were already like God. They were made in the image and likeness of God. So he's trying to trick them with something they already have in God. And so sure enough, what is he doing? He's trying to get them to think that God is not as good as he purports to be. That, that God really doesn't want, it, want you to uh, avoid this tree for your own good, but he wants to, you to avoid this tree because he wants to keep some stuff to himself. That he's a selfish father, that he's really not as generous as you think he is, that he really doesn't want all the best that you think he wants for you. So go ahead and do it, and you'll see that God is really not as good as you think. And he's been running this trick 
on trying to convince us, delude us into thinking God is not good ever since that time. Matter of fact, it's one of the reasons why atheists don't believe in God. The great famed atheist Christopher Hitchens, who wrote the book, not the demonic delusion, but the God delusion, who has chosen to ignore the evidence that God exists. And by the way, the evidence that God exists is absolutely overwhelming. If you'd like to know more about that, I wrote a book called After You Die. It chronicles all the evidence that we have that God exists, but that's not my subject today. He ignores all the evidence in favor of the fact that God doesn't exist. And one of his calling cards is this. He says, well, if God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? What's he saying? He's saying doubt the goodness of God. This is the enemy's trick to get us shipwrecked in our faith. And this is why I'm doing this series. And by the way, what's interesting about even though Adam and Eve sinned and even though they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and even though their sin had generational eternal consequences, God still was good to them. God still covered them. God still made a sacrifice for them. God still promised to redeem them. And God still kicked them out of the garden. And you think, well, Pastor, why is that good? Well, do you know God kicked them out of the garden for their protection and ours, right? Because when God kicked them out of the garden, he put an angel with a flaming sword in front of the garden so no human being would ever be able to enter back into the garden again. Why? Because if mankind ate of the tree of life after he had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, before he was redeemed, he would have remained in that unredeemed state for the rest of his existence. And so God kicks him out of the garden, puts an angel there to protect mankind from remaining in that state forever, knowing that he wanted to redeem them. And so even God's punishment is good. That was a good place to say amen right there. And so the enemy of our soul has been tricking us ever since. And so my heart, and what I felt like I put on my heart is I said, I want you to do a whole series on how good I am. The greatest thing that God wants us to see about him is how good he is. That we have a good, good father who wants the very best for our life. He wants our lives to soar. He wants our lives to be blessed. Matter of fact, he says, I want you blessed coming and going. He says, I want you so blessed that blessings come on you and chase you down. God wants you prosperous. God wants you healed. God wants you happy. God wants you whole. God wants everything like that for you because he's a good, good father. And if you being evil, the scripture says, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father in heaven give good things to those who love him? This is what God wants for your life. And so this is why we're doing this series right quick. Let me just give you five quick points from Eden about why, impo- why it's important for you to believe that God is good. And this isn't my subject. This is just kind of like a little extra. Number one, when we don't believe God is good, we're susceptible to the enemy's plans. See, Adam and Eve didn't believe God was good, and so what happened is they fell prey to the enemy's plans. Number two, when we don't believe God is good, we will abdicate God's best for us. God's best for them was Eden. But they didn't believe God was good, and so they had to abdicate what God wanted for them. Number three, when we don't believe God is good, our faith will not work. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you don't believe that God is good, your faith won't work. Number four, when we don't believe that God is good like Adam and Eve, we will run from God and hide instead of to God. You know, part of, the, part of what happens is when we mess up, we think that we have to run from God. When we mess up, we think, you know what, we can't go in God's presence. We've got to stay away from church. We've got to do all these kind of things. And that's part, part of the reason for that is we don't understand how good God is. The safest place to be when you mess up is in the arms of your heavenly Father. Number five, when we don't believe God is good, we'll give up our authority over the enemy that has been given to us in Christ. Adam and Eve were given dominion over all the works of of God's hands, dominion over the entire world, earth and everything on it. Satan was on the earth at that point. They were given dominion over him, but when they didn't believe God was good and sinned, as a result that they lost that dominion and Satan was able to exercise dominion over them. We get that back in Christ, thank the Lord. But these are some of the things that happen when we don't understand that God is good. And so that's why we're doing this series. Matter of fact, years ago, some of you might remember this, you've been in church for a long time. Years ago, we used to have a a statement, you remember it? We say, God is good all the time and all the time, right? Say it like you mean it. God is good all the time, and all the time God is. We need to get that in our spirit. 
It's not just something that we say. It, it's so true, and it's so impactful in every single way. Now, the scripture that God led me to, the story that God led me to, to, to launch this series with, is one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible. It's an oddity. Matter of fact, it's so odd that most people don't even know it exists. Most people skip right over it. Most preachers will never talk about it because of how odd it is. The Bible story that I'm referring to has the worst of the worst sins in it that you can possibly think of. It's filled with incest, injustice, trickery, prostitution, selfishness, scandal, fornication, lying, cruelty, revenge, hate, and a whole host of other sordid sins, not from people who didn't know God, but from people who were God's best at the time. And, and, and the reason why God led me to this story is because when mankind is at their worst, that's when God's goodness is at its best. And so that's the whole purpose of the story as we embark upon it. And normally what I do is normally I give my, my, my uh, I read the text, the main text, and then I give my title. But today I want to do it in reverse order. I want to give you my title. It's very simple. God is that good. He really is. He's that good. And I want to read the text, and I have, have you sitting down when I read the text, because when you see how crazy this text is and how I read it in church, some of you would have passed out. So I needed you to be seated for this. All right, Genesis chapter number 38, beginning in verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hara the Adulamite. And I don't know if it's pronounced Hara or Hira, but I'm going to pronounce it Hara because what they did was horrifying. And it was told uh, Tamar saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah for she saw that Shelah was grown and that she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought that she was a harlot or a prostitute because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and he said, please let me come in to you for he did not know that this was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? Translations, in other words, I got to get paid in order to be promiscuous with you. That's in the Bible right there. She said, have you ever looked at your old self? This, this ain't going to go down without some type of payment going to happen right now. This is in the Bible right here. And so uh, he said, I'll send you a goat from, from my flock. In other words, I'll pay you later. Notice what she says. She says, well, will you give me a pledge till you send it? She said, I don't take checks. <laughs> she said, I need something right now. I'm not going to go by your word. No, no, no. We ain't going to do our thing, and then you're going to promise me a goat, and I'm going to be waiting all day for that goat. I need some collateral right now. Now you know why hardly nobody ever preaches this. Watch this. Verse number 18 says, then he said, what pledge should I give you? In other words, Anything, 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 anything you want. Isn't it amazing how men will give up anything for something as base as two minutes of a good time? Ladies, that's your power right there. You just bargain at that time. You know, you get what you want at that time, right? He's like, what can I give you? Anything, anything. So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he said to her, and when, then, he, then, he, then he gave them to her, and he went into her, and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on her garments of widowhood. In other words, she did her thing, and then she got back in her church clothes. She, 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 she got rid of, she, Sunday was over, so she got back in the world, and she did, she did her thing, and then she, then she got back to, I'm going to put on my church clothes and get my hallelujah back on, but everybody don't know what I did the rest of the week. That, that's what she did right here. Watch this. And then it says, and Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. 
Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot who is openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of that place said, There was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, Let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. Burn her to death. I mean, she sinned. You might as well go ahead and burn her and burn that baby too. Anybody bothered by that? Burn her. Not just her, but burn that baby also. Anybody bothered by the fact that they wanted to kill two people? The, the mom and the baby on the inside. Anybody bothered by the fact that, that nowadays you can actually give birth to a child and then kill it afterwards? And, and they call that a woman's right to choose? That's not a woman's right to choose, my friends. There's something preposterous about that. And so he said, burn her, burn her, burn her. There should be something that goes on the inside saying, what kind of evil is this? Burn her? That's a little extreme, don't you think? When she was bought, brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she says, please determine whose these are, the signet cord and the staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to my son, Shelah. And he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was that when she was giving birth, one put his hand out, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, this one came out first. And it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Crazy, scandalous, sinful, of every single kind kind of story. Incest, prostitution, trickery, lying, deceit, fornication, revenge, and maybe even a little justice. What in the world, Pastor, is this story in the Bible for? What can we spiritually get out of this? And what in the world does this have to do with God's goodness? Five things I want to share with you about God's goodness. God is that good. God is that good. You say, how do we know how good God is? Well, let me give you a little bit of the backstory so that you can pick up on what I'm about to teach you. I didn't read you the whole story because of time's sake. But here's the way it really went down. At the beginning, um, Tamar was married to Judah's first son. Judah's first son was Ur. And we don't know much about Ur. The Bible doesn't talk much about him. But we do know that he was sexually deviant in his behavior. So sexually deviant that he died in judgment, leaving Tamar as a widow. Now, in Bible days, if you were a widow, it was the obligation of the father-in-law to be your provider and protector by giving you another son to marry if he had one. And this was called the Leverite vow, and it made sure that widows would not be destitute, would not be the lowest of the low in society and economically disadvantaged in any way. In other words, if a widow was not married to somebody else or a Leverite law was not performed in a widow's life, that widow would become the lowest of low in society, and she would have no way of providing for herself. So they instituted this thing called the Leverite law, which meant that the father-in-law would give the next son to marry the widow. He would have a child with her, and then she would still be in the lineage, and she would be taken care of. And so Judah had another son. His name was Onan. So Onan says, okay, I'll do it. But he didn't really mean it. And the Bible says that Onan would go in, and he would sleep with Tamar, but instead of impregnating her, this is a quote from the Bible, don't get mad at me, he would drop his seed on the ground. And the Bible doesn't say he did this one time. It says he did it over and over and over and over and over again if you read it in the original language. In other words, what he was doing is he was posing as somebody who wanted to perform the Leverite vow by giving her a child so that she would stay in the, in the bloodline. But what he was really doing was using her for sex. 
Are you all still there? It's in the Bible. And because he was wicked in his ways, the Bible says he too was judged and died. Now Tamar was left as twice a widow. Twice a widow meant that she would never probably be picked up by anybody else. She would never be married by anybody else. And so she would live the rest of her life disadvantaged and disenfranchised and no one to provide for her. But Judah still had a responsibility. And the responsibility was still to be her provider and to take care of her. And if he had another son, then he would need to pledge that other son to her who would perform the Leverite vow. And he did have another son, and the other son's name was Shalah. But Judah didn't want to give Shalah to Tamar because he believed that Tamar was a widow maker. He believed that anybody who married Tamar would die, and he already lost two sons, so he just said he would do it. He told her, go on back to your father's house and wait there for my son Shalah to grow up. He needs about five years before he's ready to be married, and when he's grown, I'll give him to you. But he didn't really mean that. All he was doing is to try to get her out of his hair so that he could look good in the eyes of the culture of his day and do what seemed to be right in the eyes of God but wasn't, and he was planning the whole time to leave her destitute she didn't know that though so she goes back to her father's house she's waiting for Shalah Shalah grows up and she realizes he's not giving me Shalah this ain't gonna go down like that and she decides to take matters into her own hands she finds out that Judah's time of mourning is gone The loss of his wife has passed, and, you know, he's been without a wife for a long period of time. And his his friend, who we're calling Hora, maybe it's Hira, but we're calling him Hora, says to him, hey, let's go up to Canaanite country for the sheep shearing festival. And that's what it was. It was a big festival in Bible times. He said, let's go up there. And, And this is Canaanite country, which is wheels off living in Canaanite country. The lewdest kind of sexual practices that you could ever imagine, boozing and drinking and all of that kind of stuff. And this is what they did at these sheep shearing festivals. And so his friend says to him, in order to drown your sorrow of having lost your sons and losing your wife, let's go get drunk and let's have sex with women. This is Judah. He's supposed to be a child of God. He's the best that God has got on the earth at that particular time. And so word gets back to Timnah that Judah is coming to Canaanite country. By the way, one of the reasons why God kept Israel in slavery to Egypt for as long as he did is to protect them from the Canaanites because he knew if they were exposed to them for long periods of time, they would have lost their Christianity and went the way of the Canaanites. So God kept them safe under the the rule of Egypt because the Egyptians and the Hebrews hated each other and and God knew they would not mix the same way they would have mixed with the Canaanites. So even God's slavery was good. And so she knows they're coming down. And she says, I know what I, I'm going to do. He's, he's been without a woman for a long period of time. He's going to be drinking. He's going to be exposed to all of these, these sexual innuendos and lewd acts all around him. I'm going to sit by the roadside and pose as a prostitute. And sure enough, he's going to want to sleep with me. So Judah comes on by. And Judah sees her, and Judah says, hey, let's kick it. She says, pay first. He says, I left my wallet at home. She says, what do you have as collateral? He says, you, she says, you can give me your signet and your cord. What's the signet and the cord? Signet was a long, uh, a, a small circular item about that big and about that round, and it was worn on the neck, at, on the cord. Sometimes it was even attached to the staff. And it, this signet was as unique as your fingerprint, you would roll the signet in clay and it would make a mark that was unique to you. So there was no way if somebody had your signet that you could say it didn't belong to you. So he gets, gives her the signet. They sleep together. She gets pregnant. And Ju- Judah doesn't know she's pregnant. He goes on his sheep shearing festival. She goes back home, puts back on her widow clothes again. And everybody thinks life is going to go on. He thinks the sexcapades are behind him. Three months go by. And Tamar starts showing. 
Word gets back to Judah, your daughter-in-law, who is supposed to be acting like a widow, who is supposed to be waiting for your son, isn't really as widow-like as you may think she is. She's been fooling around. She's been playing the role of the harlot. Matter of fact, she's three months pregnant. And Judah says, because he's got a safe face in the culture of the land, burn her to death. Because this is a disgrace to Judah and his family. Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with God's goodness? This seems like Jerry Springer in Bible times. <laughs> Number one, God is so good that he fights for us when it's not fair. One of the things we have to realize about God is that injustice done by those in power to those who can't help themselves is a big deal. When someone who can intentionally uses their power to oppress someone who cannot fight for themselves, that's a big deal to God because God sees that as an unfair fight. And all throughout the Bible, you will notice that there is specific attention given to protecting the widow. Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 17 says, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. Judah has used his power in a male-dominated society to oppress somebody who has no power. He has used the double standard of sex that has been since the beginning of the time to exert power and push Tamar into a no-win situation for her life. What was the double standard of sex? That he could go ahead and have sex whenever he wanted, wherever he wanted, and get high fives by his friend. But if she had sex and got pregnant, the whole society would want to burn her to death. And so he has used his power and his influence to oppress somebody and leave them destitute for the rest of their life and God said that's an unfair fight and what, so what, what Tamar does is she takes matters into her own hand was she right? no but was she more right than him? yes how so? well remember what Judah said she's more righteous than I why? because I didn't fulfill the vow I didn't give my son Shelah to her and here's the thing about God God doesn't judge based on just the act that is wrong. See, we look at everything and we see somebody who does wrong and we go get them, punish them, hurt them, imprison them, talk about them, gossip about them. They got what they got coming to them. But God doesn't judge like that. And by the way, God is not quick to judgment. God is slow to wrath, the Bible said. God takes everything into consideration that has led up to somebody doing something wrong. Is it still wrong? Yes. But God understands the reason why some people make wrong choices easier than other people is because of everything that has led up to the wrong that they have chosen. Some people don't have the same advantages that we have. Some people don't have the same education. Some people don't live in the same kind of cushy neighborhoods. Some people haven't had a father, haven't had a mother. Some people have been abused. Some people have been subjected to drugs and alcohol against their will. Some people have had all sorts of stuff happen in their life and so they are prone to make bad decisions easier than those people who have prestige and power like Judah. And so God looks at what Tamar did and God says, even though it's not right, it's an unfair fight. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to interject myself into this unfair fight and I'm not going to allow one mistake to destroy her destiny of being part of the lineage of Judah. Because Judah was the tribe from which Jesus came from. And every Hebrew girl wanted to be part of the lineage and the tribe of Judah because that's where the Messiah was going to come from. And God said she made a mistake, but that mistake is not going to mess up her destiny for the rest of her life because she was involved in an unfair fight. And when you get involved in an unfair fight, God fights for you. That's how good God is. Watch this. Number two. Number two, God is so good that he blesses us when we don't deserve it. Anybody shocked that God blessed them, Judah and Tamar, with two kids? I'm shocked by it. Tamar played the role of a prostitute, tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her. Judah, supposed to be a man of God. Going down to sheep shearing time, boozing it up, sleeping with prostitutes, 
wanting to burn people, using his power to oppress somebody else. If I was God, I'd be like, you both are going to die right now. Ba-bam, ba-bam. What does God do? God blesses them with twins. Interestingly enough, how many sons did Judah lose? How many sons did God bless him back with? Isn't it amazing that he was trying to burn the place that his blessing was coming from? God will bless you in crazy ways. God will bless you sometimes in ways that will surprise the heck out of you. You'll be like, I can't believe you blessed me, God. God, I can't believe you did that. See, we, we, try to, we try to pretend like the reason why God blesses us is because we did X, Y, and Z. We try to pretend like the reason why we get blessed is because we're that good. But I, know, I want you to know that the reason why the story is in the Bible is to let you know that God is so good that he blesses you even when you don't deserve to be blessed, even when you ought to be punished, even when you ought to be shown no mercy. But God is so good that instead of him letting the judgment come upon you, God blesses you and you, you escape without the judgment coming upon you. And sometimes we get blessed and we know we shouldn't be blessed because we know what's going on in our life at that particular time. But we can't let on and we can't tell church people what was going on in our life despite the fact that we got blessed because they won't understand because church people still think the reason why God blesses is because we are that good. The reason why God blessed not because we're that good. The reason why God blessed because he's that good. Even when we don't deserve it. I've said this to you a couple of times, but I'll say it to you again. God is interested in more than just not punishing you. If God was only interested in not punishing you, then Jesus would have appeared one day on the earth, died on the cross the next day, resurrected the following day. That would have been good enough for us not to get punished for our sins. A life for a life. Jesus' life so that you get to go free, so that I get to go free. But God was interested in more than just pu not punishing us. He was also interested in blessing us. And so Jesus showed up as a baby, lived a life for 33 and a half years, a life that was worthy of everything that heaven had to offer, a life that deserved the best of the best. And when you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, we not only get his death credited to our life, but we get his life credited to our life so God can bless us even when we don't deserve it because he's not blessing us for us. He's blessing us because of Jesus. He is that good. That's how good God is. Number three, God is that good that he uses what was sent to take us down to turn us around. God is that good that he uses what was sent to take us down to turn us around. Y'all know who Judah is, right? Yeah, you just read about him, Pastor. Yeah, but Judah was one of the brothers of Joseph, son of Jacob. Twelve sons, twelve tribes. Judah was the dude who decided to sell Joseph into slavery. Everybody else just wanted to kill Joseph. Came out, you know, little brother, acting like he was better than everybody else. Gave him a wedgie, threw him in a pit, beat him up a little bit. Like, let's just kill him. Judah said, well, what profit does it have for us if all we do is kill him? And then go back and tell our father because we dip his, his coat in, in a kid or a goat's blood and tell our father an animal got him. How does that benefit us? He says, I know what we should do. Let's sell him into slavery. At least we get a little change out of the deal. He said, then we'll dip the coat in the blood, bring it back to our father, and we'll say to our father, do you recognize these? And he'll recognize that it was his son's Joseph because that was the coat Joseph was bragging on. And then all of a sudden, he will realize that Joseph died, but really wouldn't have died. Really, we got paid just to sell him into slavery. That was Judah. That was who Judah was. Judah was far away from God. As by the time he gets to the story we read, is it any wonder why his kids are sexual deviants? And Judah can't look in that mirror. How many know it's hard to look in the mirror when the mirror points back who you are? He can't look in that mirror, so what does he got to do? He's got to blame her. It's her fault. She's a widow maker. I can't give another son because every son that marries her dies. No, every son that you have dies because they are degenerates in the area of sex. Now, I shouldn't have said sex. I should have said fornication because sex is not a bad thing, but fornication is. You all realize the difference, right? Sex is marital relations between a man and a woman. That's beautiful. Fornication is anything outside of that context. And so he can't look in that mirror. He doesn't realize it's not her fault. It's his son's fault. 
And so he has fallen so far away from God. He's selling his brother into slavery and so on and so forth. And, and so sure enough, he tricks his father into thinking that his brother is dead by using the blood of a kid or a goat and showing him something be that belonged to Joseph. Fast forward to Tamar. How does Tamar trick Judah? By exchanging something for a kid or a goat and showing everybody something that belonged to him. Same exact thing that he did that he led the way to trick his father Jacob. Those sins are sent to take Judah down. Did you notice what happens when Tamar says, recognize these? What does Judah say? He said, oh no, she's more righteous than I. He owns it. And this becomes a spiritual awakening in the life of Judah. Judah all of a sudden looks at him. He goes, what have I done? I can't believe how far away from God I have fallen. And then fast forward into Judah's life later on. He appears before Joseph as Joseph is prime minister. And Joseph wants to keep Benjamin so that they bring back. And, and he doesn't want to break his father's heart again by losing another son. And so this time Judah says, no, no, don't keep my brother. Take me in his stead and let my brother go. Here is a man that once would use his power to oppress somebody else who is now saying, you know what, let them go. I I'll be oppressed instead of them. What a change in his life. How did the change happen? Because God used the stuff that was sent to take him down to turn him around. That's what God will do for you. He is that good. Amazing. When you think about this, this is how God does it. The devil will send something into your life to take you out. All of a sudden, you'll look at that thing and you'll be like, I need to get right with God. Look at me, all I do is drink, I'm always drunk. I need to get right with God. Look at me, all I do is mistreat my wife. I need to get right with God. Look at me, all I do is curse like a sailor, I need to get right with God. All I do is smoke weed all the time, I need to get right with God. All I do is watch porn all the time, I need to get right with God. God will take those things that were meant to take you down and he'll wake you up with them. He'll get you to look at yourself in the mirror of those things and realize that you are a man that is undone and that you need Jesus and that you need to get right with Jesus and God will take the very things that are sent in your life to take you down and he will use them to turn you completely around around because sin is only fun for a season matter of fact the Bible puts it like this do you know how God by the way leads us to repentance Romans 2 4 he leads us to repentance to his good it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance see a lot of people always say oh, God's gonna whack this person and hurt this person and do this blah, blah, blah. do you know that's God's last resort Judgment is always the last thing that God tries in an effort because nothing else has worked in order to save our souls. He's slow. To just, he's so good. And we sometimes take the goodness of God and we think that God is, is condoning what we do. It's not, a, it's not condoning. What God is trying to do is he's trying to let us realize that goodness that we didn't deserve was granted to us. And when that goodness touches our heart, our heart gets transformed and changed. He's that good. Amen. Number four, God is that good that he refuted, refuses to make our morality his measuring stick. You ought to get so excited about that because some of y'all are deviant. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. God is so good that he refuses to make our morality his measuring stick. Did you notice the names of Tamar and Judah's sons? One was called Perez, remember? And the other one was called Zerah, right? And, and, and Perez is the one who broke through. Perez is the one who, even though uh, he was supposed to be second, he came out first. Zarar was the one who stuck his fist out and they tied the ribbon around it. And then he was supposed, but then the, the hand went back in and Perez came out first. And that's why he's named Perez because Perez means breakthrough. And in Bible times, it was the firstborn child that ought to get all the blessings. And the secondborn child, not the blessings. But do you know why God put the blessing of the firstborn on Perez and not on Zerah? It was because it's a 
type of us in Jesus. The blessing should have been put on Jesus, but instead the curse was put on Jesus. Come on, somebody, so that the blessing can be put on us. God, is that good? Perez, it means breakthrough. Watch this, watch this. Matthew chapter 1. This will blow your mind. It blew my mind. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1 is a part of the Bible we always skip over. Bet you, you don't read it. You know why? It's the genealogy. Anybody read genealogies? I'm like, I got time for that. I can't pronounce half the names. Just go on to the good stuff. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. How many think he's a pretty important person? The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, and Judah begot who? Perez and Zerar, by who? Tamar. Are you kidding me? Did, did you notice who is in the lineage of Jesus Christ? Not, not people with stellar character, moral mess ups of the worst kind, prostitutes. Harlots, people who use injustice and their power to oppress other people, drinkers and trickers and people who are disloyal and people who want to burn other people. Judah and Tamar are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. How in the world did they make it into the lineage of Jesus Christ? Here's the message. Because God wants us to know he refuses to make our morality his measuring stick. If he used our morality as his measuring stick, how many of you know none of us here would be right with God? Here's what I know about me. I hope you come to the realization of this about you, that our righteousness, our good works is as filthy rags. No matter how hard I try, and listen, I believe in living a holy, set-apart, sanctified life, but no matter how hard I try, I always fall short. But thank God, he doesn't use our morality as his measuring stick. Thank God that he doesn't judge me based on me. Thank God he judges me based on who I am in Christ. That when I got put in the cleft of the rock, Jesus Christ, I got hidden in Christ. And when God looks at me, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus in me. And for that reason, I am right with God and you are right with God. That is why they're in the lineage because he refuses Amen. to make our morality his measuring stick. But I like the fact that Perez is in there. What does Perez mean? Breakthrough. Do you know why his name is Breakthrough? Because God wants us to know that the law that they were trying to keep, the Leverite law, well, when this one dies, then you get this one to marry this one, and you ask the, the brother-in-law to go sleep with the sister-in-law, but only to impregnate her and never to sleep with her again, and even though she may be pretty, and even though he may be good looking, just have him do it one time and then go back. Like, people can do that. It's impossible to do. It's like people come up to me and say, Pastor, you know, um, we live in together, but we, we give our life to Jesus Christ, so we sleep in other rooms now. We don't have sex no more. I'm like, yeah, right. I bet you that cat's got wheels. <laughs> How do I know? Because it's impossible for us to behave ourselves the right way. We are chronically human, and no matter how hard we try, we are going to fail. And so here is this a person, this child named Perez, that means breakthrough, that is against the backdrop of the law that nobody else could fulfill, the Leverite law and all these people trying to fulfill these crazy things, and all of a sudden we get a Perez, we get a breakthrough. And what is God saying? That grace has broken through the law. That grace has taken the place of the law. That it is not by works that we are saved, but by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we are made right with God. Let grace break through in your life. The last thing I want to show you, God is so good that he keeps his promises. Watch this. Judah was from the line of Jacob. You remember Jacob? Jacob had the, the two wives, Leah and Rachel. Leah was the one he didn't want. And by the way, when you read the Bible, you're going, two wives, was God okay with that? Just because the culture was okay with it doesn't mean that God was okay with it. Matter of fact, it was never God's plan for a man to have more than one wife. That's why he didn't make Eve and Evelyn. He just made Adam and Eve. <laughs> one man, one wife for everybody. 
But the culture was such that it was permissible. And so you can't just read the Bible stories with our cultural insights. It's not something that's normal today or accepted today. It's not right in the eyes of God. But so he had two wives. One was Leah. One was Rachel. He didn't really want two wives. He only wanted one. He only wanted Rachel. He went to go work for his father-in-law, Laban. Laban made him work for seven years. At the end of seven years, he was expecting that Laban would give him Rachel. And instead, Laban's like, surprise, I'm going to give you Leah. He's like, well, I don't want Leah. He's like, well, that's who you get. You want Rachel, you got to work some more years. I thought about that. I'm going to go back to my daughter's fiance. I'm going to say, you need to work for me for free for at least 10 years. <laughs> he works a few more years. He gets Rachel. Rachel and him have two sons, Benjamin and Joseph. Leah has at least six of the children, a few more than six. One of the children that she has is Judah. Judah comes from the unwanted wife. Judah is in the lineage of Jesus. If you back up from Judah, you go to Jacob. If you back up from Jacob, you go to Isaac. If you back up from Isaac, you go to Abraham. Who was Abraham? Abraham was the one to whom the, the Lord said, through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. In other words, the promise of the Messiah is coming through you. Now, what's so strange about this is if you watch the promise travel, it travels through imperfect human beings, one right after the other. The promise of the Messiah is first carried by Jacob, who makes the mistake of stealing his birthright from his brother Esau. Judah then carries the promise by withholding his son Shalah from his daughter-in-law Tamar. Then he carries the promise by impregnating his daughter-in-law by a prostitute. Then they have a son whose name is Perez, whose downline is David. David then carries the promise by, through the mistake of Bathsheba. Their offspring is Solomon, who is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And if you watch this promise of the Messiah travel, you watch it go through imperfect person after imperfect person after imperfect person who messes it up the whole way, it wasn't like the promise was protected by Frodo. <laughs> this promise was carried by people who were like, so what? The Messiah is going to come through us. Let's just have incest. So what? The Messiah is going to come through us. Let's just get drunk tonight. So what? The Messiah is going to come to us. Let's deceive people. They didn't care about the promise, but the promise kept traveling. And I asked the Lord about this, and I said, Lord, why in the world would you allow your promise to keep going? They tried to take your promise out, but it keep going. Here's what God said to me. He said, because even when you're faithless, I'm faithful. God said, I make roads through the ocean. I make rivers through the desert. God said, I do the improbable and the impossible. God said that I stand for what is right even when you forsake what is right. God said, if I made you a promise, I will see to it that that promise comes to pass. God said, because the promise is really not as dependent upon you as you think it is. The promise is really dependent upon my faithfulness. And all you need to do is just give me a little something to work with just faith as a grain of a mustard seed and if you will give me a little something I will bring my promise to pass in your life you can mess up and you can make mistakes and you can turn your back on me but if you'll just turn my way that promise will still travel in your life I don't know who I'm talking to right now but maybe you've given up on your promise and God wants you to know he is that faithful that he will perform his promise in your life. God is so good. His word is good. His works are good. His ways are good. His promises are good. His word is faithful. He's so good that he fights for us when it's not fair. He's so good that he gives us blessing when we don't deserve it. He's so good that he takes what was sent to take us out to turn us around. He is so good that he refuses to make our morality his measuring stick. And he's so good that he brings his promises to pass even and when we are faithless. That's how good God is. Here's my prayer for this series. Here's what I want to see every one of you grasp in your life. I want you to grow in your realization of how good God is because it colors every single aspect of your relationship with God. 
It affects everything that you do. And so each week we're going to talk about the goodness of God and the goodness of God, one different aspect of the goodness of God. And my prayer is that by the end of this series, you're not just going to read Psalm 107 verse 1, but you're going to be able to say it from your heart. I give thanks to the Lord for He is good. He's that, that good. When I look at my life, and I hope you do the same thing, and I look around and I see everything that God has done, I think, man, you're so good. Because I didn't deserve that, and that should have messed it up, and that should have ruined the destiny, and that should have been punished, and you should have picked somebody else because of that. But God, you did it anyway. And I said, I give thanks to the Lord, for He is that good. I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through, that God is that good. He loves you more than you'll ever, ever know. And He wants the absolute best for you. Would you stand on your feet?